We are almost done. We'll be finishing the first week of December in Westminster. Can you believe it? We'll be going through this whole <laughs> confession together. And hopefully this won't be the first, this won't be the last time, right? That we'll continue to do this. And the next time, maybe more and more of the church will join us on this journey. But does anyone want to share so far how this has been for them in terms of nourishment, um, challenge, going through Westminster? I'm just sad to hear that, you know, the first of December, I really enjoy it. Same, yeah. It's been immense. It's been immense for me because I've had an opportunity to sit back and, and, and for once learn instead of reading, which I don't mind reading, but it really has given me an opportunity to be nourished. So I think sometimes we forget as leaders that we are uh, a part of the sheep, but we smell like the sheep. And so uh, it's time for me to be a sheep. Amen. Thank you for that, Pastor. Amen. I was always interested in doctrine, but I thought of it as dry until we started doing this. And it's so open. Yes. Yes. And then hopefully the thing is now once you've been through it, you can teach it as well, right? The best the best way to learn is to teach. I've learned that. This is the first time I've ever taught Westminster, so I've I've just I've enjoyed that. It has opened up to me as well. I've never <laughs> elements of, of these chapters that I was concerned about are like, I don't know, you know, I want to make sure that I'm staying in the right lane and I'm staying scriptural. And uh, as I actually wrestled with it and studied it, I found that, wow, there, there's really something here to challenge me. Um, as, we, as we keep saying, though, Westminster is not the Bible. It's not perfect. It's not fallible or inerrant, but it is an attempt, right, to teach us and to dig into the, the ideas of the Bible that are so clear. So today we're looking at a very fun chapter. Kind of these last couple of chapters of Westminster are, are delightful. Uh, but let, let us not forget, it's always in these chapters that we kind of go, eesh, right? We're like, all right, how are we going to deal with this? That are often the most needed or the, maybe the most forgotten. Or ignored. Ignored. On purpose. On yeah. purpose. We should never avoid what makes us uncomfortable, right? In the word. In fact, that's where we should uh, probably open up the most regular. Because that means the Spirit is speaking to us about something that we need to address. And today, I think that's one of those points. And uh, the modern English puts this condemnation by the church, or you could better understand it as church discipline. Now, condemnation and discipline are two words we kind of shy away from. Uh, but let us remember that part of the root of discipleship is discipline. So, you know, we can talk about uh, differences of word or connotations, but to follow Christ requires discipline. Discipline of self, discipline in life, spiritual disciplines, and discipline within the church body. Uh, so there's a, another way we can think about this is accountability. How are we accountable to one another? Any good relationship has boundaries of accountability. Any marriage has boundaries of accountability. Any, you know, father-son daughter parental relationship has boundaries. My remarriage uh, for me is I'm learning that um, there are two, two different def definitions for discipline. The world would say discipline is punishment. Uh, and uh, biblically, discipline is exactly what you just said. It's accountability, but it's corrective action meant uh, for the good of the one being disciplined because the one giving us discipline absolutely loves us. Yes, yes. Well said, Al. And that is what we're going to look at today, and even from our book of order in the EPC, is that church discipline is never meant to be, and we are talking about this earlier, it's never meant to be this scarlet letter mindset um, where it's been completely abused, you know, many times in history, not all the time, but it has been abused to where we use it as a shunning or a reason to remove somebody or to make ourselves appear more holy um, or better in some way. And church discipline at its root and at its core is intended to restore a person. Amen. It's intended to bring a person back into relationship with the body and of course with Christ. And so we always aim to bring restoration. And that's as I think we'll see here in the scriptures um, is laid out for us. So let's look at our first point. Now, as we remember, just a preface, 
Westminster is building on previous chapters, so there's some things that are taken for granted here. So feel free to ask questions as a refresher if it's still confusing to you. But as we've established the church and its role and um, leadership in the church, and so that's some, and the different authorities between right the elders of a church and their authority within spiritual matters and how church is operated. But then there is the state and they have authority, right? Romans 13 within their, their area. There's a separation, but they're both God ordained. So number one, as king and head of his church, right? We don't have a pope or a bishop. King of the church is Christ. As king and head of his church, the Lord Jesus has directed the establishment of church government separate from civil authority, which is to be administered by officers of the church. So there is a reminder that even though there is a civil magistrate, a governmental authority that has been ordained by God that operates outside of the church in terms of handling civil matters or punishment, as we talked about, the, the power of the sword. Likewise and equally, there is the power within the church that has been given by Christ to handle matters amongst itself in terms of spiritual matters. Now, we don't do Spanish Inquisitions here. We don't chop off heads. We are involved in spiritual discipline, spiritual accountability, as we're going to look at. So we talk about the church is the supreme court of spiritual matters, not the state. Okay, so likewise, we don't, we don't reach over and try to control the state in terms of its its matters. The state does not reach over and control spiritual matters. They are separate and God-given. Yeah, Ted. And this is pretty groundbreaking for its time because yeah. Henry VIII <laughs> established the king as the head of the church. And Elizabeth, his daughter, continued that. So that in, in, in uh, Russia, the, the czar is the the head of, and protector of the Orthodox Church. So this is new stuff. Yes, <laughs> we take it for granted. This was get your head chopped off kind of proclamations because um, England had just come out of a very bloody civil war over Protestant and Catholicism differences. Henry VIII's children, Elizabeth and Mary Queen of Scots were fighting and slaughtering each other over these ideas. And Westminster, which eventually started the Parliament under Oliver Cromwell, these were the guys who were a part of that Parliament, these Puritans that took over the Parliament, because they understood that parliamentary state authority was God-given and important and therefore should be operated in such, in such a way. But also, aside from that, there is the church realm, and they should be separate. Yeah, Kate? We're still... Battling over this today, though. Yes. Most people will say with their mouths, oh, the separation is a good thing. But there's a lot of issues that are spiritual issues or, or um, jobs that Christ gave the church yeah. that the government and a vast amount of people are saying, oh, no, that's the government's job. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so there's still so much division because there's this battling over whose responsibility is that and that power struggle. They right. say yeah. that, but they don't really mean it. Mm -hmm. Now they're also trying to legislate what you can say and eventually what you can think. Right. Yeah. I think you mentioned this before, but it, so is this where our separation of church and state comes from? Because it sounds to me from the word, this, we think of it nowadays as protecting the state from religion, but they kind of tend the other way around, right? Correct, right. yes. Well, well, but yes. Yeah. No, and, and that's in the First Amendment. What you right. These ideas that we talked about, we, we talked about this in our, our our new membership class that the revolution that happened in America was originally called by the British the Presbyterian Revolution. Exactly. Because it was these ideas that were carried over that were really formed came from, you know, like I said, we're, we're, we're pointing to biblical principles here is the best we're trying to do. But John Calvin, who was a lawyer. He really put this on paper in Geneva of the separation of church and state and began teaching that and they began living that out in Geneva. And of course, everyone who was running away from England at the time, who was Protestant, came to places like Geneva. Not everybody, but some, some went obviously to Holland and the Dutch area, but then a lot went to Geneva. John Knox being one of them from Scotland. And learned these ideas under Calvin and then brought them back once 
uh, the uh, head chopping was done for Protestants once there was a, an open window back in England and Scotland brought them back and established them there. And people from Holland um, and England, of course the Plymouth movement was from the Netherlands area, was directly Calvinistic ideas, which is what was the basis for the Westminster 100 years later. So what ended up happening in the world in terms of democracy or call it, you know, a constitutional republic came out of these biblical ideas that there is in fact a role of the state that is God given. Can't be Romans 13 lays it out clearly. And then there is a God given role of the church, obviously, quite clearly. And the two have separate responsibilities and they do not step on each other's toes. Now there are the initial, as we can see in scripture, role of government is quite limited. And the role of the church has limited limitations that we sometimes maybe will try to reach out from. But as we see, what we talked about last time in terms of civil authority, not last time, but a few weeks ago, is that the primary responsibilities of the government is the power of the sword to protect and to punish, and um, taxations to, as we see, to do uh, keep upkeep or civil. But now that is obviously where the rubber beats the road in terms of <laughs> how much tax and to what, because right then yeah. it gets bureaucratic and things of that nature. Now the revolutionaries, um, there's a lot of, I, I know I don't want to belabor this too much, but they really, if you want to kind of see the justification for the revolution, there's a lot of wonderful sermons and history to where they justified scripturally that the government had overreached and was no longer following its ordination. It's the same as the church should no longer, the church shouldn't, you know, when if I start preaching you another gospel, I'm not following ordination. I've therefore lost my ability to speak. The same goes for the government and the revolutionaries, the founding fathers. They 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 spent they had a three hour prayer section before beginning wow. writing the um, Declaration. the Declaration and the Constitution. They were deeply grounded in the Word. If you go, um, Nalanda reminds me of this of uh, bridge builders, the Barton family. They 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 if you ever look. Yeah. Um, Wall builders, sorry, the wall builders. Uh, they're a wonderful group that talks about this, um, looks at the founding fathers and their love for the Lord. Not all of them, but many of them. Um, but early on in the revolution, I mean, right after the revolution had ended in America had got its independence, there was an English historian who was trying to write about the revolution. And he asked John Adams, who's really responsible for this movement? Who, who would you point to as the five key figures and he doesn't list Jefferson, he doesn't list Washington, he lists five preachers. And that ground was set by the First Great Awakening under Jonathan Edwards and Whitfield and Wesley who came over. So <clears throat> as we see, our government and the privileges that we enjoy today were built on a biblical basis. Now, of course, one can make the argument that it's gone off the rails in a lot of ways, but uh, it's definitely there and it's, it's changed the world. Right? It was un it was for things that were not happening. The ability to vote, uh, the ability to make amendments, just groundbreaking ideas. Yeah, Pat. But I, this testifies then further, though, to the sovereignty of God, right? Because yes. in, in setting this up, um, Scripture doesn't assume that the state are all believers, right? And so we know that God God has ordained it and can even work through not just Cyrus's, but, but the real jerks as well. Yeah, you would call you know, a, that a common grace. God has given a common grace to humanity and its benefits, um, and that includes his structure that he's given us through the church and through the state. You know, the first, if you look up the Plymouth Project when they came over, you know, the pilgrims essentially, John Winthrop, he preached, look up the sermon, A City on a Hill. First thing, they got on that rock at Plymouth and they preached the sermon, A City on a Hill. They really believed that it was on them to build um, not a utopia, but a a society of the people that really took the Bible seriously. Like I said, this is not utopianism, but there is, because we are sinners, as, as Jesus says about the rules of marriage, God has given us a framework to operate in that is for our blessing. And we see that in Scripture. There's a lot of debate, a lot of gray areas, but we need to continue, I think, to reform ourselves to what, what is, what is, where does Scripture give us the ability to do things. So, um, 
So we do not discipline as the state does, but we do control the boundaries of the church visible. Okay, now we talk about the two differences. The church visible, that's the saints here on earth who are alive and, and hidden in Christ. And then there are the saints universal, the saint invisible, which is our, all of our brothers and sisters, the great heavenly hosts that have passed on, but we are still, they're still part of the church, right? The church is victorious. Yes. This rule has been given to the presbyters, which we, we talk about is just the Greek word used in the scripture for elders. So we believe in a plurality of leadership found in elders and ordination. Same as the state having civil magistrates, so like the elders are the civil magistrates, right? They're the, they're the representatives of the church in a sense. But they lead on Christ. They lead as Christ would lead. And they're called to operate in a biblical or Christ-like manner, right? With certain qualifications and responsibilities. Point number two. To these officers, this is speaking of the elders and the deacons, the, you know, different churches separate how that leadership looks, but we would, we would have responsibilities and leadership for our elders and responsibilities and leadership for our deacons. So these, those are church officers. To these officers are committed the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which empower them to free people from the guilt of sin or to bind them to it, to close the kingdom of heaven to the unrepentant by the word and condemnation, and to open the kingdom to repentant sinners by the ministry of the gospel and by withdrawing condemnation as the occasion demands. Okay. A lot to unpack there. That kind of sounds like something we're not. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, key passage being used here by uh, Westminster is obviously Jesus speaking to Peter in uh, Caesarea Philippi. When he says, who do people say I am? He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, you are right, Peter, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, a lot of people have taken this verse and use it differently. They say, oh, Peter is the first in line of papal authority. Right? But really, we see this as him speaking to, yes, Peter would have a leadership role, but to the disciples, to the apostles, who would start the, the movement in Acts, as we see. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we believe, in a sense, in apostolic succession through the ordination of elders. So when you will see our new elders being ordained, in January, there is a moment of laying on hands from other elders and a reaching out from the church. And we really see that, that that's the power of ordination, which we see happening all through the New Testament. But that is the ordination is not necessarily in the person, right? It's in the office. It's in the, the elder, yeah, for, for a term. <clears throat> but we lay the hands on, and that's that's the you know saying that you we are setting you apart to do this work, but it's a it's a it's a it's a domino all the way back to when Jesus essentially breathed and laid his hands on the apostles. So the apostles set apart, set apart, and it's this beautiful line of succession of church authority given to us by Christ. Now, as I said, this is, this is debated in different denominations as to what that means. Uh, some see it as the role of Pope. We, we see it as the role of really, you know, the apostles of the church. Now, apostle is also debated. Um, it seems that Paul, you know, Paul and Peter and the early church had different forms of what apostle meant. Usually that was someone who walked with Christ, who knew Christ personally, and those to follow outside of that were the elders. As we're going to see today in our scripture, it says the apostles and the elders met at the Jerusalem council. So elders had a similar role, but they were not apostles. Apostles were those who knew Christ personally. Some commentary would say the apostles of Christ, and then you have the apostles of the church. Yes, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Because apostle just means sent one, basically. So some people view or that missionary. as or missionary. Yeah. So what is it? Semantics. Yep. I love semantics. <laughs> My seminarians are seminarians. There you go. <laughs> All right, so as we said, the role is attached to the office and not a person. And it is, it, it's, we, in our book of uh, order, which is the EPC's book, it takes us and comments on this part of Westminster. It separates the two in terms of the power of the church. It says here, this is directly from chapter three in the book of government. The powers of the church reside in the church as exercised in its courts and not in individuals. 
right? So it's not in a person who's super special, it's in the power resides in the office. So just making that clear again, that an elder is given an opportunity to serve, like a, you know, a representative or how the president should be, right? <laughs> In the book of government, we are told that there are two kinds of power in the church. First, there is the power of order, and second, there is the power of jurisdiction. The power of order is the authority given to a person elected to the office of deacon or ruling elder or pastor. It is the power to serve, primarily. It is the authority to proclaim Jesus and administer in the name of Jesus Christ. The power of order especially includes sharing the gospel, reproving the erring, visiting the sick, and letting the fruit of the Spirit be revealed in one's life. And then there is the power of jurisdiction, is the power to rule. And this is given to our ruling elders. And here is the important thing, the power of jurisdiction that we have as a church, this power to rule is never an individual authority, it is always a joint authority. It is an authority that is exercised collectively as a session, that's our local governing body, right, of elders, a presbytery, which is our regional, and general assembly, which is our our full uh, national. national. So part of reproving and rebuking the erring, which we see quite often as a, as a direct command, even from Paul to Timothy, preach the word, rebuke, correct, do it in season and out of season. So there's this, this power that is given to elders to do that, particularly in, in the role of teaching. And the power to grant the assurance of pardon to those who repent and to impose censures and discipline on those who remain impotent. This is from, from Sproul. So this goes along with that power of jurisdiction. And like I said, this is a collective, a collective role, a collective authority. But as if we look at Westminster, we close the kingdom, essentially, as they're saying, by excluding people from the place where the means of grace are most intensely focused. So, as Jesus said to his disciples at the time, the apostles, about you will be given authority to rule as I would rule in my place and to, to begin this kingdom as it grows out. And that ordination will, will be traced along the power of its elders. Therefore, this body that is going to be, that is going to be growing re requires reproving and rebuking. And as we see the apostle Paul says, there was, I handed this person over to Satan so that they will not they will learn not to blast him, so that they would come back and join the body, but to be removed at a point, which we is we're going to look at how that's done, right? We follow the Matthew 18 of meeting with a person and trying to bring the person back into fellowship. But there comes a time where a person who is unrepentant must be, and the word is excommunicated, removed from the body, set apart from the body. It's saying you are you cannot you are not a part of fellowship with us because you are in error and repeat, refusing to repent. That's the power of our discipline that we have, and it's so that they will see the error of their ways and return to the body. But that is a power, and some of us cringe at this, that Christ has given the church to do to rebuke in that way. That's the, that's why communion is so important because we're communing together as a body. And that's why you will see some people will refuse communion. Because it's saying, you refuse to repent. Because you cannot come to communion without repentance, right? And I say that every time I take communion, I say, do not come to this table unless you have repented. And I have to do that every single time. Otherwise, as the Apostle Paul says, I'm, I'm bringing condemnation down on myself. Anyway, I'll stop. Yeah, Pat. Okay, so, I mean, you're, you're, you're I'm, I'm, Releasing a heresy, I think. Um, so this is the difference between us and the Missouri Synod Lutherans, because as a as a teaching elder or the ruling elders, you can pronounce, you can offer me the um, assurance of pardon, but not you can't offer me absolution, which, which, which you've actually said that. no, I can't absolve you. I can just offer you God's assurance of pardon. So we so, so the they hold that the forgiveness actually lies. In Right. And the pastor could say, no, I won't forgive you. But yeah. the, the forgiveness is all God. We're simply excluding and knowing that we could be wrong in doing it, but we do the best, best we can so that they won't repent. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, 100%. And you know, I, I wish that I had some, I wish I had some of the Puritans who wrote this in here because I'm not sure precisely. I'm sure there'd be some mixed understanding on that. I 100% yes agree. I would not, I obviously have, I'm not a forgiver of sins. Um, but there is this church collective understanding of the body of Christ and its ability to well, you know, I'm not even I'm, I'm not even trying to pat too much you're, yes you're right I do not provide absolution I am not the one who forgives anyone who said I don't control anybody's salvation 100% no but you may be able to recognize unforgiven sin in me yes right? there is a there is a there is like a teacher would like uh, attempt to correct and, 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 and draw a, a red line at something and say Know, as, a, as a cheer, a cheering the person on yeah. to getting right with the Lord, <clears throat> yeah. um, and we and so we've been given an ability to help people do that by being able to discipline them. Um, okay, and that's what's wrong with the Amish practice of shunning, right? It's more like okay. right, and it, and, it, and, it, and it goes to like there would be I don't see any um, shunning. Uh, scriptural basis of like I'm just going to turn because then that gives them no ability to even speak in return and, and, and see love but there is an understanding that this whatever is you're engaging in or, or idea or practice it's hard, it has you cannot bring that into our body you cannot bring that into communion with us until you correct that you can go to another church I guess you can do what you want to do but we're saying that this is a, a danger to you and to the body, and therefore we're asking you to find correction before you can re-enter. But I am not controlling that person's salvation, nor are the elders. Kind of like in a classroom, a teacher would put a student in timeout not to shun them, but to exclude them so they want to be part of the class. Mm -hmm. once again. Yeah. Great analogy. Yeah, except minus the dunce caps and all that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the scarlet, yeah. Can you say something, Katie? I started. Well, we've got to touch on some of it. So many people stretch this in a lot of ways. I mean, if we're talking about every person who's in you know, we have an empty church. Yeah. They mess right. up on the daily. Mm -hmm. But there's a point where, and, and sometimes some hurts run deeper, and it takes us sometimes, like, I hope I'm not the only one that doesn't always repent like within 30 seconds of the right. time that I mess up because it's just not realistic. Yeah. But there's some things not only that can hurt, well, sin always hurts us, but it hurts those around us. Yes. Yeah. His yeah. job is to, you're the protector of your flock. The leaders are the protector of the flock. And at some point, you know, sin takes us way farther than we ever imagined it would take us. It has ripples way wider than we ever think. And when those ripples, you know, start to affect the other sheep, that's when you get like Ninja Pastor Vic. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> 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 not, not, not to be mean, but we grow up thinking that, well, my sin is private. It's none of your business. Yes. It doesn't affect you. And it doesn't mean you go around pointing, but that's why, like, yeast. <laughs> Yeah, you can't just be like, I'm gonna pinch this little piece of dough off, and then all these is gone. Right. 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 Actually, you know, uh, as the under shepherd of my commandment, that's your role. Yeah. Uh, because uh, if if you don't fulfill that role, then uh, you get that as well. Mm -hmm. you know, that was the problem that took place with Eli. He did not uh, discipline his sons. Mm -hmm. And, and knew it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that would be the, that's a pervasive role. Mm -hmm. That's part of uh, uh, God's order. Right. Right. And it's vows we we take as an ordination. Uh, and Katie, you're exactly right. And we have there's a there's a fine line we have to be careful not to cross and saying like, oh, we're holy and you're not. Right. It's it's rather the posture of we are all broken. And we're, I'm not going to stand in defiance to say to you that I'm not broken. Someone who 
might be the, the, this example of someone who I'm repentant is saying, I'm not going to stop this sin, and I don't think it's a sin, and I don't think it's a problem in the church. That's when it starts to say, well, that, what, well what else can we do but exclude you? But if someone says, yeah, I, I sin and repent, okay, brother, right here with you, right? That's that's the, that's the point. That we're all, we come here as all broken people, and there are times, yes, where I act to find, I'm not times, a lot of time where I'd say, I try to justify my sins and tell God that it's not really sin. And he has to discipline me as well, and I and there's mutual discipline amongst elders in that regard. And I would I would hope that as our elders would say, we, we see and that's that's why the beauty of the plurality is there's something in your life that is we we see an issue with and calling me to repentance on it. My job is to respond to that and repent. You know, particularly if it's a biblical reality um, and it's very important for us as elders to not abuse that to wreck it to really think hard like is this a true uh, issue is someone really in danger is this a church really in danger here do we need to address this and of course it's usually as simple as someone coming in just along the person and saying hey are you all right what's going on um, whatever maybe we've seen being able to talk the person through it matthew 18 right and then there's another shot. If the person doesn't respond to it, we send another or a group and talk to them before it ever becomes something that is, okay, we, will, we need you to step out from our fellowship for a time. But we're all sinners, 100%. We mustn't forget that. So that, that gives us a posture of grace in these matters. Um, if we rejoice when a person repents, as we should, right? If we should, our repentance should always lead us to worship. Because God's grace is always there. His mercy is born every time. Um, so as we said, this role is not given willy-nilly or under any personal opinions, right? And that's where sometimes things get a little crazy. Well, so-and-so was caught dancing, so, you know, and therefore they must be disciplined. <laughs> well... Give me the scripture for that, otherwise it's your opinion, and do not, you know, you then can step out, like, as the, maybe the government will add too many governmental programs, so the church does the same thing at times, right? Uh -huh. we, we build too many departments. Uh, the department of shutting down dancing, right? <laughs> the department of undercover, you know, going to the bar undercover, or something. gets into the, the ridic ridiculousness, and we, we, we must be very cognizant of that and not fall into that kind of legalism. We have the power to dismiss people from the Church of Christ, and it's only to those that are unrepentant, as we see from Scripture. But we also have the ability to open the doors wide, as we should, to the repentant. We should always have the doors open to the repentant and reopen doors to those who have repented. So nowhere in Scripture do we see remove that person, even to the worst. I mean, Paul was talking about a guy who was sleeping with his mom and crazy stuff, right? And he said, you need to remove this guy until he repents. But if he repents, welcome as a brother. Yes. Right? Yes. And so that gives us great hope that the person repents. You hope you better open that door up or you got nowhere to go, as Katie was saying. <laughs> we ain't got nowhere else. Yeah, go. Question. How would you handle a situation where, because some things aren't just cut and dry. Sometimes people know things are wrong. But they're just like struggling. There's just this inconsistency, like, I know it's wrong, and I wish I didn't keep falling into it. But the truth is, there's a pattern. Yeah. How would you handle something like that? Well, I think we would handle that as we handle the church in the sense of just discipleship. Um, when a person that is, obviously, because we all have besetting sins that we're struggling with. Um, I have sins that I struggle with that I'm not going to claim for a second are not sins, but I still struggle with them. They're still real and alive. That, that old man, that fleshly part of me is still real and alive. And therefore, I live and breathe on spiritual discipline of discipleship and love and grace for one another. So I would, we, there's a lot of steps and a lot of process that has taken place in the church before it becomes a matter of discipline or against obstinance. So, the complex nature we should be willing to walk in and live in and just you know really be disciples and walk the road together with um, that's that's also what i see in the scriptures is there's complexities but we have to be able to say okay we're, we're getting there together 
Now it's another thing when the person says, you know what, no, all bets are off, I'm holding on to this thing. That's a different matter, but of course, when we, we struggle and fall and get up, like we should just be ready together because we're all kind of doing this, this pattern together. So I think that's a natural part of church that is just part of our discipleship. That's how I would handle it. Uh, discipline, I don't think, comes into play until there's a real, a real leaven, a real problem that could really dislodge the church or that person. Does that help? I mean, yeah. Yeah. So with discipleship in that case, uh, I hear you maybe saying that uh, the person struggling gets together with maybe one or two people and be accountable to them to uh, help them get through it. Like we have uh, Alcoholics Anonymous kind of does that. We have the Cocaine Anonymous people that come here several nights a week and they just support each other in getting over the, temp the, the temptations and uh, coming back into the right behavior. Yeah, not only do they have the support group, they also have the accountability partner, which is their sponsor. Yeah. So there's two witnesses, the community group itself and the accountability partner. And this is, that's, yes, absolutely. We got that from the church yes. at some point. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and here's the thing, well, we don't want to ever put off or make a culture that makes people feel like they can't be real, because then you'll never get to that. The only way we have those groups, those accountability groups, is when there's a culture of vulnerability. That it's okay to be vulnerable, I'm not gonna get smacked over the head. Because I want us to be vulnerable. We have to be able to be vulnerable. Like it's another thing completely when the person is like, I'm being vulnerable, but I'm also telling you what I'm going to do, and I don't care about the boundaries of the church, right? That's different. But being vulnerable is like, I struggle with this. I'm having a hard time. I need help. That's what we want. Amen for that, because that's the beginning of healing, right? So we're not talking about like, because I don't want people to say like, well, I got this problem, and I can never let the church know because they'll just never understand me, right? No, that, that's that's a bad culture when we're at that place, where I feel like there's something that I have to keep in the closet and mind about myself, right? But we want it to be, no, you absolutely need to bring that to the table because we're here to disciple and keep each other accountable. The dis as we're talking about church discipline, I hope you guys hear what I'm saying. That doesn't come in until there is this desire to harm or stay in a sin that is hurting the person or the church. Like a harm is a harm. Yeah. That, that, that testifies to what you're always urging is to relationship. We, we have to know each other on a, on a daily basis, on an ongoing basis, so that when I start to fall into something, that he says, hey, you know, before, before it even becomes a habit or whatever. Right. And, and there's the formal church discipline that happens, but church discipline is happening all the time, right? In discipleship. It's, it's always happening. We're always, there's always an iron sharpening iron, rubber meets the road, encouragement that should be going on. There shouldn't be a formal where the elders have to really sit down and talk about it or, or bring it, bring, come to a person until it's escalated to a point where that has to take place. So that's why I said it's not willy nilly. Uh, there's a natural discipleship. Just discipline. I've seen two churches torn apart because they refused to discipline. They allowed something to continue that decimated the congregation right. and left a lot of people who just won't go back to church at all. Yep. So there's a real consequence. Real consequence. And, and I've seen things here that should have been disciplined but were not mm -hmm. uh, because we were afraid to lose members or Mm -hmm. oh. Well, or, or, or donors, uh, and right. uh, we shot ourselves. But nobody should get less accountability because they give more money than yeah, and that happens all the time. That's such a pressure. But we have to be obedient to God and our calling, right? He will take care of. And you're exactly right. Like, not just there's many examples of that. But like the Catholic Church, for example, has been torn apart by its inability to. Mm -hmm take a stand and discipline when it was needed for sexual abuse, right? And that happens in a lot of organizations because they're defending the organization or a person. We have to always be on the guard. We're never completely um, removed from that reality, always knocking our door of scandal. 
And a lot of what we're talking about has to do with scandal, you know? Pa pastors, right? Pastors get themselves in trouble all the time. They're big knuckleheads and they do really dumb things. And there has to be accountability on your pastor, your elders, and not protection. And that's what we have to see here. We have a role, a God-given role, to keep the church as pure as we can in, the, in a loving, gracious, restorative way. But never to protect the church or, or protect a bad um, what is my word? Protect a bad habit or a, a sin or a person. That was Paul's lament for the Corinthian church. That was that was his uh, that was his lament for the Corinthians. Hmm. Because uh, they were letting uh, they they were overlooking some things and it was about to destroy the church. Yeah. Yeah, the Corinthian, the Corinthian church. Yeah, Corinth. Yeah. Yeah, you want to look at a church that was messy. First and second Corinthians. It was messy. Um, number three, here we'll, we'll go kind of quickly here. The condemnation by the church is necessary. It's necessary in order to reclaim, here we go, reclaim and regain spiritual brothers who have committed some serious offense. To deter others from committing similar offenses, to purge that leaven which may contaminate the whole lump, to vindicate the honor of Christ and the holy profession of the gospel, and to avoid the wrath of God, which might justly fall on the church, should it allow his covenant and the sacraments to be profaned by notorious and obstinate offenders. There, there's a kind of a sum of what we've been talking about. Um, from our book of order, it puts it this way. Church discipline. This is like the summary of the purpose of church discipline. The purpose of church discipline is always to build up and not destroy, right? And that's straight from Westminster as well. To reclaim, right? You reclaimed a brother, as, as Jesus says. Rejoice when you in Matthew 18. You reclaimed a brother. It's to reclaim and to regain. That's the goal, not to judge. To reclaim, regain, build up, not destroy. It's exercised under a dispensation or a period of mercy and not wrath. Its ends are the rebuke of offenses, the removal of scandal, and the vindication of the honor of Christ, the promotion of the purity and general edification of the church, and the spiritual good of the offenders themselves. The spiritual good of the offenders themselves. We have to understand this, this, this must be driven home over and over again. To build up and not destroy. To regain, to reclaim, to restore. And its promotion is, you know, we want to remove scandal. We want to remove offenses. We want to remove leaven. Because this vindicates Christ. And it's written there so clearly. Of course, it goes on to say that to vindicate the honor of Christ and the holy profession of the gospel. And to avoid the wrath of God, which might, as Ted was saying justly fall on the church should it allow his covenant and sacraments to be profaned. Right? We, part of the removal of this is so that we can vindicate Christ and not profane the gospel. Warn it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> this is my family here. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> You got a good one there. Oh, yeah, man, <laughs> My, it was my uncle and my grandparents and my mom's son. So they're here to visit from Payola today. Um, this, as it says, is a necessary function of the church. A doubt in your mind. If we do not follow this, we're in um, contempt of our ministry, particularly as elders. Similarly, like a civil magistrate, an elder who does not practice church discipline is not living out the role of the office. Elders who abuse this role outside of a scriptural basis are failing to live up to their ordination, right? So there's a double whammy there. Failure not to act and a failure to overreact, <laughs> okay? And this is, right, we, we, we want to hold this kind of accountability to our civil magistrates. That's our big hope. That's why we do votes and we get really upset if the president does something that's outside of that office or doesn't pay attention or doesn't care, right? We, we, we expect that from that office in some level. Now, this is a necessary function. Why? Because the church will become infected. Sin begets sin. 
and similar sin must be deterred, right? To deter similar sin. Say, no, that kind of attitude, that kind of sin, um, not that kind of sin, that kind of obstinance, sin is sin regardless, right? That kind of attitude, I guess, would be the best way of saying it, must be deterred. It's not, it can't, it's, it can't be part of the body, unrepentant. Christ must be honored. It's all for the vindication of his, of his church. We aim to avoid God's judgment and removal of his spirit. Now, here's the, the Christ honoring part often gets taken, right? We're honoring Christ by, by beating up all the sheep. You know, we're honoring Christ by purging things. No, it's we're honoring Christ by, as, as Ted was talking about, by the removal of scandal. Because when these things come to light, which they eventually will do, as sin begets sin, it's the worst PR possible for Christ, right? We see how a church is just destroyed by wickedness, unrepentance. And that happens on, that's multi-layered in so many ways, from a church that just wants to be a club to a church that's got all kinds of sexual scandal. It begets itself in, in, in different ways. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And more importantly, when God uh, decrees sacred, is always sacred. Yes. His, yes. His church is sacred. Like I said, we're, we're riding a fine line here of being sinners and sheep ourselves who have a responsibility and doing it as Christ would do it. And we have to always be looking, right? To, to be good leaders in Christ's church, we gotta always be reading and looking at Christ. <laughs> we gotta be so, we have to say, okay, what is his character in the situation? How did he deal with these things? Right? You are no good as an elder, I'm no good as a pastor if I do not stay intimately close to the true shepherd and his word. Because when I look at Jesus mm -hmm. in the New Testament, I see a gracious, gracious shepherd. Mm -hmm. Strong with sin, but for the rep repentant, man is he there. <laughs> it doesn't matter yeah. what you've been up to, but for the repentant, for those who are like, I'm broken, help me. Man, he is there. But for those that say, Pharisees, nothing wrong here. He has a hard word. Right? And so we're talking really about pharisaical attitudes. Yeah. Sometimes people that need to be disciplined in the church are not the, the sinner in our minds. It's often might be the elder. Right? <laughs> and not just the elder. I mean, uh, one of our musicians has a lot of people not come to church because... Another member just said something really cruel to her. Mm. And that's it. I'm not coming. And it's, we never know. And, and the person who said it to her was not an elder. Mm. Just another member. Mm. Who was crabby over some pharisaical and did damage. Exactly. It does. The season does, works with grace. It does do damage. Yep. It, it, it gives a, a rotten. Yeah, it, it, it just it puts bodies at the door before people even get a chance to see Christ. Criticizing something in a really cruel way. Right. And rather, we should be ripping the roof off to get people before Christ, having no boundary. Right. Okay. So, this is um, probably going to be a little controversial. Sorry if I heard anybody's feelings. That's all right. Um, <laughs> But, and, and that can be very, very harmful. It can be. I, I totally understand that. On the flip side, maybe then you say, okay, they don't want to come to church. You know, worship in church is done outside of this building. To, if, if we're doing it right, it's supposed to be done outside of this building. That's when somebody calls or goes to lunch or comes alongside because within that discipleship, there could be a switch of mind and heart saying, you know, I'm really not there for the focus of our people. And as we realize that our gaze adjusts back to the Lord, then it becomes well, it's about our hurts. And we're like, you know, I can deal with grumpy people. They're irritating me. Maybe I know where my boundaries lie. But does that make sense? That we should reach out to her and uh, try to reconcile. Well, yeah, just that's when another lady comes alongside. 
does church with her outside of this building for growth, for spiritual growth, to where she realizes, I really need the gathering. Right. Yeah. My focus can shift then from my hurt to yes. the things that I would gain from being there. Mm. Yes. And that's how like should good shepherding doesn't just involve like the, dealing with shepherding. the offender, but going after the sheep. Yeah. You're absolutely right. That's we try to like band-aid things, right? And that's a cut, but there's a root. And if instead of focusing on fixing that one situation, you focus on the root focus of let's take you, you a closer relationship with Jesus. Right. When our gaze fixes, that cut is going to mend. Right. right. Rather than just putting band-aids on it, trying to fix a specific situation. Or right. I yes. So as as as, as sheep, we're also in many ways supposed to be shepherds because we're supposed to have a shepherd's heart. Mm. Yeah. Basically, that's what uh, my sister's saying. So not only are we sheep, but you know, sheep and a herd are very gregarious and they depend on each other as a herd. Mm. When, that, when that's broken up, then they become very agitated. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Well said, Shepherd Island. That's good. Uh -huh. Absolutely, Katie. I think that's a stark reminder for us is how we should be acting and responding as the church. Uh, because those little, they're, they're little things, right, that can be, can be dealt with if we take the mind of Christ, especially go after the person. We want to be known as a church that goes after its sheep in the, in the best way, as a good shepherd does, you know, that mm -hmm. leads them to green pastures and quiet streams. Um, so, and to just ending here, our fourth point from Westminster is this, the best way to accomplish, so it talks about the reasons for church discipline, talks about the role of the office, but then it also says, again, reminding us here, we've been talking about this a little bit, but how that is done, right? The parameters of how it is done, so we don't go too scarlet the letter or off the rails. The best way to accomplish these purposes is for the officers of the church to act in accordance with the severity of the offense, which is an important point, and the guilt of the offender by warning the offender first, excluding him from the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for a time, or excommunicating him from the church. And this is taken primarily, again, as we said, from Matthew 18, which should be our main approach to dealing with one another. And of course, the season of assault and done in a gracious way. As we said, uh, there, there's differences here among churches as to how far they will go. Um, at what point is it ready to like remove someone from the sacrament or excommunicate them? We hope and pray that a person is retained and restored in simple discipleship and walking with that person, right? But we are given instructions and parameters on how to use church discipline. So reading from Matthew 18, for those of you that aren't familiar, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And remember, Jesus gave us other reminders about this, about the log in your eye. And get right. Be humble, because you too need this love and rebuke. If they listen to you, you have won them over, right? Which is the purpose of church discipline, is to win over a brother, to restore them in the communion of the saints. But if they will not listen, right, obstinance, take one or two others along. Try it again. Take them the coffee, right? Loving ways. This isn't like, just come sit down in the office, like good cop, bad cop stuff, right? No, this is as Katie described. Go after the person. Get Figure out what the, the problem might be. Very, very simple. They might have been offended over something. What is the issue here? Can we have coffee? Can we, can we restore? Right? That's the goal. Take one or two along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses, which is important, coming from the law. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And that's where maybe communion comes into play. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So that is the model coming from Jesus. And we see that kind of displayed in the Apostle Paul when he says, I removed this person for a season so they would learn not to blaspheme. And like I, we've been talking about this whole time, that is last case. And in terms of it becomes 11 and sin begets sin and it can, can destroy our churches if it's not dealt with. Um, so as we look at those in steps, right, step one, we warn, take the coffee, call to repentance. It's usually done privately. And it's done once or twice, right, twice. And then step two, 
excluded. Now, communion is interesting. Some people really love this, and they, they beat people over the head with, <laughs> "Have you come to me?" You know, in communion. So I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily lead that way. I think it's really a towards the end, last end of the measure. Um, what what you do with communion? I, I tend to always remind people before we take communion, as we should all be reminded, to repent, get right. If you have something against your brother, go and make right with them. Do not come to this table if you have anything. You know, you're continuing to hold as a grudge against someone because that that negates the beauty of the gospel when we do that. Come empty-handed. Then, of course, excommunication or removal, hopefully for a season, but not necessarily permanently. I know we're kind of running out of time here, but final questions on this on this last this last point, this last section. Thoughts, concerns, heresies. Has this been a helpful discussion today? Yes. Excellent. There's a lot here, right? We tend to kind of shy away from this subject. It's hard. But it requires us to, I guess, what I'm always reminded is walk close to the chief shepherd, to Christ. Let him, you know, the closer we are to him and smell like him and know his character, the better we are in dealing with one another. Because as our mission statement of the church says, we want to know Christ and become like him. So get to know him. Keep getting to know him. Keep walking with him. Keep strengthening that bond. Amen? Amen. Okay. Debbie, can you praise in this? Yeah. In the Heavenly worship? Father.